Good evening. Tonight I am beginning with Parshas Baloscha because unfortunately last week I was stuck in an airport, couldn't make it home to have it videoed, and this week's Parsha really is Shalach, which I'm going to continue into, and we will have tonight a discussion of some inyonim in Shalach, but we didn't want to leave blank the week of Baloscha, so I don't know how many of you go to listen to a Parsha of a week before, but nevertheless, we thought it was a good idea to at least include something uh, about Baloscha to have some continuity. Now, Baloscha begins right after Nasso which finished discussing the dedication and celebration of the 12 tribes, the Shifte who each brought a carbon. And the Medrash asks, why is Baaloscha beginning with the discussion of the menorah placed right after that discussion about the celebration and the shvotim, the juxtaposition, why is it right there? And the, the Torah, the Medrash answers, and Rashi brings down this statement, that Aaron HaKoyen, was very dejected that lo hu v'lo shivto, not he nor his tribe, his shevet, was included in bringing their own carbon. Every other shevet brought, but not shevet Levi. So he was dejected about it. So HaKadosh Baruch Hu said that they brought the carb as a one-time offer. But what you're going to have is that his would be for generations, that the menorah would be something that would exist each and every day. And there's an obvious question that it didn't remain forever, and that's the Lushan Leola. There was a Chorban Bias Rishon, a Chorban Bias Sheni, and there was no menorah after that. So the Ramban addresses this question. And he also addresses why is it that Aaron felt dejected? I mean, it, he wasn't a jealous person. He was a tzaddik gomor. And if the other shvatim were meant to bring the carbon for the day, so he that was their job and that was what Hashem wanted. What did he feel so dejected about? He had his other role. He was kind and gadol. And his shevet also were the ones who served the Koyanim in the Mishkan and then in the two Bate Mikdash. So what is said is, and another question before we answer the first two. The Pasik says Vayas Kain Ahara, that Aaron was commanded to do the menorah, and it says he did so. He did so. And the question is, why does the Pasuk have to say that he did so? If Hashem told Moshe Rabbeinu, tell Aaron to do A and B and C, do we think that he wouldn't have done it? The Pasuk has to tell us he did it? So the answer is that the Zoyer HaKadosh asks a question in Bereshus. Why is it that by every creation it says Vayomer Elohim Yehi that there should be this and be that and the ends up each pasuk 
and it was so. There's one exception when it talks about the light. Let there be light. It does not say like it does by every other creation. No vayehichem. So asks the Zohar Kadosh, and it answers and says mishum delo havachem, because it was not so that that light was taken and hidden. Ledoros that when Mashiach will come, or the the Baal Shem Tov said that it's hidden in the Torah, and when somebody learns Torah lishma, he has such delight. That feeling of such spiritual delight is the Oran Brothers. So says the Baal Shem Tov. But in any event, it was taken away and it did not remain. So the trees, the water, the skies, that remained so as it, when it was created. And it's to this day what was created then. So it says, and it was so. Now, when Aaron Akoyim went to light the menorah, he felt bad that the light was taken away from Klal Yisrael and that they were going to have to wait to Mashiach to enjoy that spiritual bliss and delight in the flame of the fire, the Or Hagonus. And indeed, the light that we have outside that we think is light. We have night that's pitch black. And by day, we have light. It's not the real light. And the Swarm say that when Mashiach will come, it'll be like a light switch that goes on to a semi-dark room. And we'll see what real light is at that point. But Aaron, when he wanted to light the menorah, he was not happy that Klai Yisrael was not enjoying any of that Or HaGonos. So he wanted, through his tremendous Kavana and Kedusha, <clears throat> to bring down that Or HaGonos into this menorah that he was lighting. And indeed, the Ramban says right on the spot that he had in mind that when the base of Migdash will be destroyed, but at that point, Klal Yisrael will begin their, their Hanukkah celebration as they light the menorah, that indeed in the menorah is going to be that or Agonis. He drew it down. So indeed, when HaKadosh Baruch Hu said that it's going to be forever, yours is going to be forever, Meaning that from the time that he lit the menorah for the first time in the Mishkan, and it went for the 479 years, and then it went into the first place of Migdosh, 410 years, and then 420 years for the second place of Migdosh, after it was destroyed, but Klav Yisrael is lighting the Hanukkah menorahs. So when he said, yours, they had their Corbin of the day. And that was it. You're going to have forever. It was forever. Because it was first in the menorah of the Beis HaMikdash. And when that was destroyed, it went into the Hanukkah menorah. So it was forever. And that's why the Pasuk says, Vaya'as Kain Aharon. Because that Kain that was missing in the Sedra Bereshis, by the Misa Bereshis, Vayas Kain Aaron, that he brought back that Cain, that that which was destined to have no benefit or no nothing of the Oragonos and told Mashiach that he brought it back for Klal Yisrael to enjoy its spiritual bliss. And that's why the halacha is that a person is not allowed to light the Hanukkah menorah and run away. He has to sit there at least 20 minutes, 25, and just look at it. And the Mekubalim say that what is the looking at the menorah? He is absorbing like a bladder that soaks up the ink 
into itself, the neshama is soaking up the orhaganos and drenching the neshama with that spiritual light, with that orhaganos. And that's why it says, Vayas Kain Ahara. Now, the end of that Pasuk, it says, Kasher Tsiva Hashem es Moshe, that everything was done just like Hashem commanded Moshe Rabbeinu. So Rashi says on that, Malamit Shvacho Shalaren Shaloshina. It tells us the great praiseworthiness of Aaron that he didn't change anything. In other words, he did it as was commanded. So there must be a thousand Terutzim on this Rashi, that why is it that Rashi says, Melamed Shvacho Shal Aaron Shaloshina. Would you have changed if you knew there was a message from HaKadosh Baruch Hu himself, do this and this and this? So you have to come back and say, well, I want to tell you, his great praise, he did it exactly like he was told. Why great praise? Anyone would have done it exactly. But according to what we just discussed, that's Malamit Shavach Shal Aaron, it's telling us the great praise of Aaron, Shaloshina, that he did not agree to the change in Teva, the Shina, the change in Teva that the Or HaGonis was going to be put away to Mashiach, but he was not Maskim, and he brought it back now. He was not Maskim to keep it away from Klal Yisrael. Malam et Shavachu Shalar and Shaloshina, that he was not Maskim to the change in Bria. And that's how, according to this pshat, how we would type Malam et Shavachu Shalar and Shaloshina. Now, the appeasement to Aaron was effective because we know that the only item that was not made by any human being in the Mishkan was the menorah. That Hashem showed him every keli, every vessel, everything that had to be made, and it was made. But when it came to the menorah and he was shown, he didn't understand. Then Hashem showed him a menorah of age, of fire, and he still didn't understand. So then HaKadosh Baruch said, you know what, take a chunk of gold, throw it in the fire, and out came the menorah. So no human being made the menorah. It was shaped. Why? But the answer is because the menorah was the only item to carry in it the Ur of Mashiach, the light of the Ur HaGonaz. And that had to be created only by a Kodesh Baruch himself. Even Moshe Rabbeinu, as great as he was, could not make the menorah. Otherwise, there's a kasha, the shulchan, and everything else, the mizbechos, the, the shel nechoshes, and shel uh, zahav, were intricate. But why did they have no problem? He understood it right away because it was destined not to be made by a human, even as big as Moshe Rabbeinu, but only by a Kodesh Baruch because it was going to serve as the vehicle to carry the Or HaGonos in it throughout the Mishkan and the two Bate Mikdash, and then into <coughs> each and every Yid's house in their Hanukkah menorah. Now, it's interesting that in Baloscha we have the, the Parsha of Pesach Sheni. And the Yidden came who couldn't bring the first Pesach, and they said to Moshe Rabbeinu, Lama Nigora, why should we lose out? Now, really, there's a few questions. 
What do you mean, why should we leave out, leave out? There are rules. And halachas, you were tome or you were bederech rechoka. So under those circumstances, you're not mechuyiv to bring the carbon. So what do you mean, why do you feel you're being left out? You're exempt from bringing it. Why do you feel <clears throat> that there's something lacking? I mean, if someone was in the hospital, he couldn't dab him with a minion. And he couldn't answer to Kedusha or to Yeheshme Rabba. He doesn't have to say, Lama Nigara, go make me extra Kadeshim so I can answer. He was exempt. He was in a situation that he couldn't hear. There was no minion or whatever was happening to him. So... One of the answers, and we see, for instance, if someone didn't take a lul of an esri, that there was nowhere in the town a lul of an esri. We don't find that they came to Moshe Rabbeinu for any other mitzvah, that if a group legitimately missed out on the mitzvah, why should we be lacking in this mitzvah? Never happened. So what was it about Korban Pesach that brought out this unbelievable desire to be Mekayimit when it never happened, such a request, not before and not after? And the answer that's offered is that every <clears throat> mitzvah, of course, illuminates, is with luster, is dynamic, we are enriched, we're drenched our neshamas with the kedusha and the elevation of what a mitzvah does to us. But over here, when Klal Yisrael came together to do the Korban Pesach, and they were in their groups, they were not alone, people had their groups that they were in, it was like a mitzvah being done with the entire Jewish community. When I take a lul of an esri, whether another thousand standing nearby are taking the lul of an esri, that's nothing to do. A person could be in his house taking the lul of an esri, he could be in a sukkah, he could be anywhere. But over here, Klal Yisrael came together to Anara Bias to bring the Korban Pesa. So when they got the mitzvah of Korban Pesach, it elicited, it brought out in the Jews an ascension. The whole Klaiso went into like an elevator. And not only they were enriching themselves by doing the mitzvah and bringing the Korban Pesach, but they felt a communal elevation that never was experienced before. And that's why the Targum Yonason ben Uziel, who was one of the biggest Tanoyim, says that how did they bring a Korban Pesach in Mitzrayim? And he says they were not allowed to. They had to be in the Harabayas. And he says that the whole Kla Yisrael were put onto the wings of eagles and brought from Mitzrayim to Yerushalayim to the Harabayas. They brought the Korban Pesach, and then they were carried back to Mitzrayim. So says the Targum Yoinus and Ben Uziel. And for the next 39 years, in the Midbar, they didn't bring a Korban Pesach, because they were not on the Harabayas. You're not allowed to bring it out of Yerushalayim. So when they did bring it, every person, those who brought it and those who didn't bring it, felt something, there was a metamorphosis, there was a transformation, that Klal Yisrael was being enriched not only by having done the mitzvah, but they suddenly had a new uniqueness to their unity as a Klal Yisrael being uplifted by the fact that they were doing together the mitzvah, and it was like a united Klal Yisrael doing the mitzvah. And that's the reason this is the only place that we find that Klal Yisrael 
stepped forward and said, why should I lose out on the mitzvah? Because whenever there was another mitzvah, if they didn't do it legitimately, they didn't ask, give us a second chance. They didn't ask. But now they wanted a second chance because they felt they were being left behind that this uniqueness of elevation that was happening to the whole Qal Yisrael, they were being left out. They were not, there was no tying it to them that they did an Avera by not bringing it, because they weren't obligated, they were in a situation that they couldn't bring it or they were not allowed to bring it. But, but on the, but on the elevation of Qal Yisrael, they were being left out and they felt it. They were encompassed within an atmosphere so holy and so elevated and so unique that they came forward to Moshe Rabbein and we want to be able to do this mitzvah and experience the uniqueness together with Qal Yisrael. So that's the second thing that I wanted to tell you about Baloscha. And a third thing is we find in Baloscha that there is a tzivoy for Moshe Rabbeinu to go gather 70 people, esfoli shivim ish, and it said, and Moshe Rabbeinu would be the 71st of the 70, which became Sanhedrin. So the Medrash says, who were these 70 people? Let's not forget, anyone that was a member of Sanhedrin, they had to know 70 languages, it wasn't just an honorary position that they became. They had to know shas. They had to know. They had to know halachas inside out for them to pass and for them to be able to function. So the Medrash says, "Who were these people? They were Jews who were made shoytrim. They were the police against the Jews in Mitzrayim." And if the Mitzrayim, the Jews in Mitzrayim didn't do what they had to do, the number of bricks or the, the work that had to be achieved, that they were supposed to beat the Jew, but they never did. And these Jews took the beating themselves. And that's why they became the 70 of, of Sanhedrin. But the question is, okay, they were the nicest guys in the world. They took the beating themselves, but they were regular people. How could they function as, as Sanhedrin? So they get an A++ for being moist and nefesh for another Jew. But, so the Mephorshim say in the Medrash, that they became, when they became Sanhedrin, they suddenly had Ruach HaKodesh and they knew the 70 languages and they knew Shas and they knew Harapaskin. This was a gift from heaven that if you're beaten on to save another Jew, then you are given royal gifts of Ruach HaKodesh and all the things that they possessed and they became like a real Sanhedrin that later on they only took the biggest of the big to be Sanhedrin. But this first Sanhedrin says the Medrash, that's what they were comprised of. And what do we take away from this? That, that when that when in our daily lives we put our foot forward to help to help another yid in a moment of hardship or to help another yid while he is suffering 
I, I apologize, I have the window open and there's a little bit of noise outside, but the lesson is so important that we can take the simplest of the simple and it can become the highest madrega of a human being. Why? Not because he sat learning every day for 80 years, but because he put himself into a position of danger and suffering for another yid. And when we have to stretch ourselves to help another yid, sometimes it's with time, sometimes he has a flat tire and he, want, and he needs help, he's out on a highway. And we don't have the time, but we stop and we go to help him and we help him change the tire or we help him with money or we help him with other things that we're not so inclined to do, but we don't turn the other eye, then we are in a position of becoming great because we are helping alleviate the difficulty and the pressure on the back of another Jew. Thank you for listening. This is a few thoughts on Parsha's Bahalos Club.